Hey, it's Darius Clark. Let me give you some of my best bets for FAR. You got the FAR exam coming up soon. Make sure you focus on this. Here's a question on how much is accrual basis revenue if they give you cash basis revenue. So they tell you cash collections were 30000 How much is accrual basis revenue? They say accounts receivable at the year end was 7000 and began the year at 3000 How much did you earn if you collected 30000 and you'd have to know within a minute what to do with the beginning receivable balance, what to do with the ending receivable balance. And of course, you would add the ending receivable balance of 7000 because that represents what was earned this year, even though it won't be collected until next year. Since you want to know what was earned this year, add the 7. Then you would subtract the 3000 beginning receivable balance. Why? Because although that was collected this year, 3000 that was earned last year. So you don't want to count the 3,000 twice or you'll be double counting it. That would be like Enron accounting. So take out the 3,000 because it's already in the 30,000, but add the 7 and you wind up with 34,000 is earned. Answer choice A. Also making my best bets list would be a business combination question where you have to calculate goodwill. How much is goodwill at the time of purchase? especially if the parent doesn't buy 100% of the sub, but they buy 80%. So you've got to calculate implied fair value. So they tell you the parent pays 200000 for 80% of the sub. First thing you've got to do is divide 200000 by 80% and get the implied fair value of the sub. So do that and tell me what you get. Sure, you get 250000 if you divide 200000 by 80%. Now that's important because... If 80% is worth 200,000, then 100% has to be worth more. So the whole company is being valued at 250,000 based on the purchase price of 200,000 and the percentage acquired 80%. So if the company's worth 250,000 and you want to know how much is goodwill, you'd have to know how much of the company is based on asset values. Well, if the subsidiary undervalued their inventory, by 20,000 at the time of the purchase, that means they have inventory that's worth 20,000 more than what it says on the books. And the book value of the, all the net assets is 175. Assets minus liabilities equals 175. And another 20,000 is the inventory. That means you're going to compare 195 as your total asset value to the 250,000, which is what the subsidiary is worth, and you'll get goodwill of 55,000, which is answer choice C. Another best bet would be a question on government. Government accounting, especially with regard to the cash flow statement, because the exam always has you comparing the cash flow statement for government with the cash flow statement for gap purposes. So here, try this one. Dutch Cities Enterprise Fund earns interest on investments of 25,000. How is this amount reported on the statement of cash flows? And you'd have to know that for government cash flow, interest received is investing inflow. So C would be the answer. Interest received is an investing inflow. Whereas if this was a question on GAAP and some company's cash flow statement and they received interest on an investment, it would have been operating. But because it's government, interest received is investing inflow. Another one of my best bets would be a bonds question. This question simply asks about, all right, here's another best bet, a bond question. And this question wants to know, are these bonds going to be issued at a discount or a premium? And as a result of that, will interest paid to the bondholders be more or less than interest expense on the income statement? Good question because it doesn't even involve a lot of numbers or calculations. Fodicorp issues 10% million dollar face value five year bonds when the market rate's 8%. So you got a company's rate, stated rate is 10, the market rate is 8. Anytime the stated rate is greater than the market rate, you could see that the bond is at a premium to the market rate of interest, the bond will sell at a premium. Let me say that again. Anytime the bond's stated rate is at a premium to the market rate of interest, 
in this case 10% is greater than the 8% market rate, the bond will always sell at a premium. So now that we know the bond will sell at a premium, how does that affect interest expense compared to the cash interest that's going to be paid to the bondholder? They're not going to be the same amount. So if the bond is sold at a premium, you've got to know that interest expense will be less than the cash paid to the bondholder. And that's because interest expense is based on the market rate, which is lower, 8%. Cash paid to the bondholder is based on the stated rate, 10%, which is higher. So now that you know the bond is sold at a premium, the question asks, as a result, interest expense for Fody Corp will be higher than cash paid to the bondholders when? And you'd have to know that since bonds were sold at a premium, interest expense will not be higher than cash paid to the bondholders. Interest expense will be lower than cash paid to the bondholders. And it doesn't matter whether the effective interest method is used or the straight line method is used. Interest expense will be lower whenever bonds sold at a premium. Interest expense will be lower than the cash paid to the bondholders, making the answer choice D, neither. All right, another best bet, leases. Because the lease rules have changed recently, so you got to keep up. A lessee signs a three-year lease for equipment that should last 15 years. There's no option to purchase, nor does title transfer. How should the lessee classify this lease? And under the older rule, three-year lease at a 15-year life, you'd probably say it'd be an operating lease and no liability needs to be recorded for the lessee. Well, that was the old rule. And since it's changed, the exam will test the new rule because the CPA exam loves to be a relevant body. They want to make sure that they're testing you on cutting edge, recent changes all the time. So A, which used to be the right answer, is now the wrong answer. Instead, look at B. It's an operating lease, and a liability needs to be recorded now. Why? Because the new law for leases says that if you have a lease that lasts greater than one year, you have to show the asset and the liability on your balance sheet if you're the lessee. And that's new, and they're going to test that. Used to be you had to meet certain criteria in order to put that asset and liability on the balance sheet. As a result of the new rule, though, you can expect that asset and liability to go on the lessee's balance sheet if the lease term is greater than one year. Notice choice D as a short-term lease and no liability should be recorded. No, what's a short-term lease? That's less than one year. And that's the only way you can get away with not putting the asset and liability on the balance sheet is if it is a lease that lasts less than a year, then it would be a short-term lease. But this one says it's a three-year lease, so no short-term lease here. Here's another. This time they want to know what's the impairment loss that will be recorded on the December 31st income statement under U.S. GAAP. So we have to determine if there is an impairment loss and how much it is, because one of the choices is A, zero. So on December 31st, Crater Inc. analyzed a patent with a cost of $6 million net carrying value of five million and they analyzed it for impairment and they determined the following that the discounted cash flows from this patent are four million five the undiscounted future cash flows are four million eight how do we determine whether there's even an impairment here and if there is what's the amount of impairment well there's a two-step test isn't there and the first step is where we compare the carrying amount of five million with the undiscounted future cash flows of four million eight, and you can see that the undiscounted future cash flows are lower than the carrying amount, which means this asset appears to be impaired. Since we're carrying it on the books for five million, but we're only going to realize four million eight from it over the many years or however long is left that we expect to get some benefit out of this patent. So we see that two hundred thousand looks like the answer to what's our impairment loss. But since accounting is conservative, we have to say, since there is an impairment, what's the worst case scenario? Let's discount those cash flows. So instead of $4,008,000, million, eight, we're going to compare the carrying amount of $5 million to the discounted cash flows of $4,005,000 million five and see that our impairment loss is actually up to $500,000, letter D, 
and our journal entry would be to debit the impairment loss for 500,000 and credit the patent for 500,000. And assuming this patent is held for use, no reversals are permitted should it go back up.